Ladies and gentlemen, the motion picture show is about to begin. To fully appreciate the magic of tonight's presentation, you will need a pair of red and blue Anaglyph 3D glasses. You can acquire them cheaply at a number of online vendors, and can even make them at home by coloring both sides of a sheet of clear plastic with permanent markers. To maximize these jaw-dropping three-dimensional thrills, it is recommended, though not essential, that you view this motion picture on a large screen in a dark room. Are you ready? Good. Put on your 3D glasses. Now. Through circumstance, Italian artist Benvenuto Cellini made acquaintance with a Sicilian priest who claimed to have knowledge of the dark power of necromancy. Cellini at once asked the priest to be initiated in the mysteries of this art. In the dead of night, the two repaired to the Colosseum. The priest, according to the custom of the conjurers, drew circles on the ground and diffused precious perfumes. Chanting at length in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, the priest called by their names a multitude of demons. Almost in an instant, the amphitheater was filled with legions of infernal spirits. The priest turned to Cellini and said, Benvenuto, ask them something. He answered, Let them bring me into company with my lost love, Angelica. The spirits made no reply, but the priest said, They have declared that in the space of a month you shall be in her company. He then requested that Cellini stand by him resolutely, for the legions above were a thousand more in number than he had designed. The priest endeavored by mild means to dismiss the devils in the best way he could, but they would not hearken to him. The two men trembled in ungovernable fear, and Cellini was certain that he would meet his death. The priest implored him to burn more perfumes, and faced with this noisome smoke, the spirits at last melted away. The priest declared that as often as he had entered magic circles, nothing so extraordinary had happened to him. The two men parted ways that night, never to meet again. According to William Godwin's 1834 book, Lives of the Necromancers, there was nothing magical about Benvenuto Cellini's experience in the Colosseum. The demons he saw were merely illusions, produced by natural means. The burning of perfumes created a dense cloud of smoke, which rendered more formidable and terrific the figures that were exhibited. The necromancer reported certain answers given by the demons, but those answers were heard from no lips but his, the creator and author of the scene. But how did the charlatan necromancer create these images of legions of demons? Did he have actors, stooges, hidden throughout the ruins of the Colosseum? Well, no. Godwin theorized that the necromancer used one of these bad boys, a magic lantern. Here's how it works. You place a light source in the main body of the lantern here, usually a candle or an oil lamp. A chimney aids in ventilation. The light comes through a primitive lens on the front. You take a slide and place it upside down in a slot just behind the lens. The image appears in perfect detail. Now, it's highly unlikely that our necromancer used one of these devices. They weren't invented until about a hundred years after the supposed conjuring took place. But there were similar devices, such as the camera obscura and illusions created by literal smoke and mirrors that were around in the 16th century. And like most legends, there may be a grain of truth here. Dutch scientist Christian Houwens is credited with the invention of the magic lantern sometime in the mid 17th century. Like many learned men of that era, Howhens was fascinated by optics, the scientific study of light, in particular in regard to vision. Howhens regarded the lantern as a gimmick, a scientific curiosity, nothing more. But it was essentially the very first projector, and a direct ancestor of the modern motion picture camera. After all, a camera is just a projector that takes light in rather than shoots it out. Without knowing it, 
Howhens had set into motion a series of scientific discoveries that would lead directly to Paul Blart Mollkop. By the turn of the 18th century, wandering projectionists called lanternists were plying their trade all over Europe. They would keep their lantern and their slides in a pack strapped to their back, show up in a town, set up their equipment, do a show, get paid, move on. These lanternists were a smash hit. Keep in mind that many rural people in Europe at that time had never seen a stained glass window before, let alone a projected image, and a perfectly detailed painting popping into existence out of nothing blew their fucking minds. But many lanternists played on this ignorance to shamelessly enrich themselves. In the 1760s, German lanternist Johann George Schropfer held fake seances in his Leipzig cafe. He hid his lantern from sight and projected images of ghosts, demons, goblins, skeletons, and dead celebrities to terrify audiences. Ghostly wails and startling sound effects enhanced the illusion, as did, apparently, hallucinogenic drugs mixed into a communal bowl of punch. By the 1790s, this sort of show had a name, the Phantasmagoria. But people weren't really buying the phony conjurings anymore. In the cosmopolitan capitals of Europe, the Enlightenment had banished superstition and bathed the world in cold, hard scientific fact. So lanternists adapted. Instead of claiming to be able to conjure spirits, they advertised their phantasmagorias as elaborate entertainments devised to debunk those charlatans who were trying to trick people and expose their secrets. And the more they performed, the more they refined the science of their art. A shadowy British lanternist, known only as Philandor, set his magic lantern on wheels, which allowed him to change the size of the image that was projected. He put his lantern behind a semi-transparent screen with the audience on the other side. He would have his assistants roll the lantern away at key moments, enlarging the image. So from the audience's perspective, a horrible demon was rushing right for them. The most famous phantasmagoria was put on by Belgian showman Etienne Gaspard Robertson in the late 1790s in an abandoned convent in Paris. Spectators entered the convent down a dark corridor surrounded by the grave niches of dead monks. They entered the performance space itself. The walls were covered in black velvet except for a large screen in the center of the room. Without warning, the lights went out and horrific images materialized all around them. Robertson used multiple lanterns to achieve his effects, and also used rear projection, just as Philandor had done. Assistants would move their lanterns back and forth and to and fro to give the impression of rapid movement across the screen. People hidden behind the velvet curtains played eerie music, whispered creepy things, or even used ventriloquism to throw their voices into the audience. The performance ended with a grand finale called The Fate That Awaits Us All where a scythe-wielding skeleton rushed toward the audience. It scared the fucking shit out of people. As the 19th century dawned, magic lanterns lost much of their novelty. They weren't particularly shocking anymore, and the secrets of the Phantasmagoria were now broadly understood by the general public. Nonetheless, lantern shows exploded in popularity. So lanternists adapted to the times. Instead of terrorizing their audiences, they began to entertain and educate them, particularly children. And the proliferation of magic lanterns brought exciting new innovations. Lanternists were no longer limited by still images. With a clever use of levers, cranks, and overlapping slides, they could make images 
move. How do you do, ma'am? How do you do? How do you do, ma'am? Oh no, what's that? It's a mouse. Don't go into his mouth. Oh no. <laughs> Photography was invented in 1839, and in the 1850s, two German-American brothers named William and Frederick Lagenheim came up with a way to print photographs on glass, which could then be turned into magic lantern slides. Projected photographs began as a theatrical gimmick, but quickly grew to serve an educational purpose, very much the ancestor of today's documentaries. Travel shows were especially popular. Lanternists could show you what it was like to take a trip down the Nile, or hike the Great Wall of China, or go on an expedition to darkest Peru. During the Civil War, Lanternists updated the paying public on the latest news from the front lines, projecting Matthew Brady tintypes in vivid detail. A crucial artistic development accompanied these proto-documentaries. For centuries, lantern shows had been essentially random, unrelated images, usually presented in random order. But in the Victorian era, that started to change. Lantern shows became more and more sophisticated, and Lanternists became much more focused on telling a story. The invention of binaural lanterns, basically magic lanterns with two lenses, allowed for smooth cuts and cross dissolves. So lanternists could change a scene from day into night, from an exterior view to an interior one, and even show multiple events happening simultaneously. By the 1870s, lanternists had laid the basic groundwork for cinema. All that was needed now was for photographic technology to catch up. Almost immediately after the birth of photography, inventors started tackling the problem of how to make photographs move. The first experiments were extremely rudimentary, little more than a flipbook animation. Subjects were photographed multiple times, with incremental changes of position adjusted between frames. Then the individual photographs were attached to a rotating disc called the phenakistoscope that when spun would create the illusion of movement. But it wasn't a true moving photograph. The often overlooked French scientist Louis Duhoron, who invented both the first process of color photography and the stereoscopic 3D technology I've been using throughout this whole video, envisioned a motion picture camera all the way back in 1864. The observer would believe that he sees only one image, which changes gradually by reason of the successive changes of form and position of the objects, which occur from one picture to the other, even supposing that there be a slight interval of time during which the same object was not shown. The persistence of the luminous impressions upon the eye will fill this gap. There will be, as it were, a living representation of nature, and the same scene will be reproduced upon the screen with the same degree of animation. By means of my apparatus, I am enabled especially to reproduce the passing of a procession, a review of military maneuvers, the movements of a battle, a public fete, or a theatrical scene. Though he filed a patent for it, Duhoran never built his motion picture camera. The science just wasn't quite there yet. But about 10 years later, a photographer in California made an astonishing breakthrough. You know, before 1873, no one actually knew how horses run. Do they lift all four legs up off of the ground as they leap? If so, do they tuck their legs in or splay them out? It's impossible to tell with the naked eye. To settle the question once and for all, former California Governor Leland Stanford hired renowned photographer Edward Mybridge to try to devise a way to capture a photograph of a trotting horse in motion. This had never been done before. You've probably heard stories about how people in the Civil War era, for instance, had to sit stock still when having their photographs taken for 15 to up to 30 seconds to allow enough light to get into the camera to capture a viable image. Subjects in motion during long exposures appear blurry in the final image. So to capture a photo of a horse mid-trot, Mybridge outfitted his camera with a custom shutter that would expose the photographic plate behind it for 1 500th of a second an unprecedented speed. An exposure that fast would require a huge amount of light. So Mybridge hung bedsheets on either side of the racetrack to reflect as much sunlight into the camera as possible. Stanford's horse Occident was trained to trot through the corridor of bedsheets without flinching. And after three days of tests, Mybridge finally captured a visible image. That first photograph was never published and has sadly not survived. It was a bit blurry, but it clearly showed Occident with all four legs up off of the ground at the same time. But Mybridge was unhappy with the results and wanted to tackle the experiment again. 
It would take years for him and Occident to reunite. Mybridge got into some legal trouble after murdering his wife's lover, but it was ruled a justifiable homicide, and in 1877 he returned to Stanford's ranch to try again. Mybridge modified his shutter to double its speed and took another photograph of Occident trotting, but it still wasn't enough. He wanted to take a sequential series of photographs that, when put together, would serve as a complete study of a horse in motion. The following year, Mybridge returned to Stanford's ranch armed with 12 cameras. He set them at 21-inch intervals along the racetrack. Attached to each was a length of string that stretched across the track at a height of three feet. When the running horse's breast snapped each string, it would trigger the shutter of each camera. And on June 15, 1878, a jockey named Gilbert Dom mounted a running mare called Sally Gardner and rode it through Mybridge's contraption. Mybridge later invented a device called the Zupraxiscope, basically a combination of a spinning phenakistoscope and a magic lantern that it could successfully project his series of sequential photographs. He called his creation the Horse in Motion. Unlooped, the Horse in Motion was less than a second long, but it was the first movie ever made. Motion picture technology advanced rapidly over the next 20 years. Mybridge continued to make movies, which spurned enormous public interest in the science of the motion of living things. A French physiologist named Etienne Jules Marais had been studying the motion of birds for years at that point, and inspired by Mybridge, he invented in 1882 the photographic rifle, a handheld camera that was capable of taking a series of pictures on a revolving disc of photographic plates. This isn't a photographic rifle, by the way, it's just a rifle. Murray shot all sorts of animals in movement. His favorites were birds, but famously, he also figured out how cats always land on their feet. In 1888, George Eastman invented film. Murray eagerly acquired this new technology and applied it to his work. Eastman had intended film to be used for conventional photography, so Murray had to come up with a way to project a motion picture shot on film. He labored for years of the problem, and finally constructed a device called the chronophotographic projector. It wasn't without its problems. Uh, film at the time, the negatives were unevenly spaced, and so the image would play back in a jumpy, jerky way. But it worked. Mybridge may have made the first movies, but Murray made the first films. In Paris in 1889, Murray shared the results of his experiments with an American tourist named Thomas Edison. In 1891, Edison's engineers in New Jersey invented the kinetoscope, which was the world's first commercial motion picture viewing system. Basically, it was a big cabinet, and it functioned much like a peep show. There was an apparatus where you stuck your eyes, and you looked in, and you saw the film playing back. Edison's team made several classics for the kinetoscope, including Dixon Greeting, Fred Ott Sneeze, and Newark Athlete. Masterpieces. The kinetoscope was an enormous success, and motion picture arcades started popping up in major cities all over America. Kinetoscopes were common sights in the mid-1890s, especially in bars, restaurants, and hotel lobbies. Edison made a fortune, and he became convinced that peep shows were the way of the future, and that projected movies could simply never compete. He was very, very wrong. Back across the Atlantic, two brothers in France named Auguste and Louis Lumiere were hard at work on yet another unprecedented invention. The Lumieres were businessmen first, and they made their living running a factory that manufactured dry plates for photography. During the winter of 1895, the brothers enlisted an engineer to build them a combination camera and projector. They called it the Cinematograph. Their father, Antoine Lumiere, immediately recognized the machine's potential for mass entertainment, but the brothers were skeptical. They had nothing but contempt for the bohemian world of actors, musicians, and artists, and saw the cinematograph as being more respectable than that. It should take on a more scientific and industrial role. But Daddy wore the brothers down and at last obtained their consent for a public demonstration. Antoine made the arrangements for a paid screening on December 28, 1895, at the Grand Café in Paris. December 28th came. It was a cold and rainy day, and only about 35 people showed up. The audience took their seats, the projector word to life, and this is what they saw.
They screened nine other short films that day, each under a minute long. They probably didn't show the famous one of the train entering the station, and contrary to popular belief, people did not get up and run screaming in horror from the theater. As we've seen, late 19th century audiences were actually pretty accustomed to motion pictures in some form. But still, this was impressive. This was different. A dark room. A large gathering of people. Huge images painted in light. Its labor had dragged on for centuries, but at long last, the art of cinema had emerged from out of the vagina of imagination. Sir, you can't be in here. The theater's closed. It's all right, I'm leaving. No, I'm going to call security. No, 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 no need to do that. I'm going, I'm going. Please do. Just go out the back way. Thank you. In attendance at the Grand Café that night was a man called Georges Méliès. Méliès was a magician, like the phantasmagorists before him. He had used magic lanterns in his magic shows before, but in cinema, he saw endless possibilities. Méliès acquired a projector in London early in 1896 and immediately set about making movies. His first films were imitations of the Lumiere brothers' work, called actualities, because they depicted mundane, real-life events. While filming just such an actuality on a busy Paris street, Méliès' camera malfunctioned. It took him about a minute to fix the machine, and he kept rolling. Later, when he projected the film, he made an amazing discovery. Méliès had accidentally discovered the jump cut. On projecting the splashed film, I suddenly saw a carriage turn into one horse, and the men become women. The substitution trick, called the mid-shot trick, had been found. To be fair, William Dixon of the Edison Company was the first to use the jump cut in his short The Execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, but Méliès took the idea and ran with it, and created some truly dazzling special effects. His first uses of jump cuts were primitive, but he refined the idea and used other methods, such as double exposures, to pull off illusions on film that you could never do on stage. If the Lumières had given birth to cinema, Méliès realized its potential. Through constant experimentation, his effects became more elaborate and more convincing, and in 1899, he started to apply them to narrative fiction. That year, he directed a six-minute adaptation of Cinderella, which was the first film ever to tell a complete story in a series of connected, dramatized scenes. He made hundreds more short films, each more elaborate than the last. In 1902, he directed his masterpiece, A Trip to the Moon. Heavily inspired by the work of Jules Verne, a Trip to the Moon tells the story of a group of French astronomers who travel to the lunar surface in a bullet-shaped spacecraft shot out of a giant cannon. Once there, they enter a cave and are captured by aliens. The aliens present them to their king, but Méliès' character throws the king on the ground, which causes him to explode and allows them to escape, pursued relentlessly by the aliens. The astronomers board their spacecraft and escape at the last moment. Falling back to Earth, the bullet plunges into the ocean, but they're towed to shore by a steamship and given a hero's welcome back in Paris. A trip to the moon was completely unprecedented, and the special effects were dazzling. In many ways, they still are. It was a worldwide success and demonstrated the unique advantages of this new medium as a tool for visual storytelling. In 1905, the first movie theater, called the Nickelodeon, opened in Pittsburgh, and by 1910 there were more than 10,000 in the United States alone. Movies were here to stay and the public couldn't get enough of them. Even today, moving images continue to captivate us, probably more so now than ever before. How much of your day do you spend staring at a moving image on a screen? Probably too much. Just because it's mundane doesn't mean that it's not spectacular. And like junkies, we keep going back for more. The only difference, really, between you watching this video and Benvenuto Cellini cowering in terror from demons in the Colosseum is that you know it's a trick.